Our next speaker is Kelly Bixby. She will be speaking on Porgy and Bess in the 21st Century, Perspectives from Contemporary Performers. Uh, Kelly is an accomplished singer and educator from Philadelphia who specializes in contemporary American art music, winning a tw 2018 Grammy Award as a member of The Crossing. She currently pursues a doctoral degree in voice performance. So let's welcome Kelly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My hope is that for those of you who attended the fantastic artists panel yesterday, will find this presentation in, in some ways to be a synthesis and a deepening of some of the things that were brought forth uh, from that group of um, incredible artists. Additionally, you will be hearing from a, um, many other singers representing a broad range of generational and performance experience. A defining aspect of the opera Porgy and Bess is that the majority of the roles are played by people of color. This stipulation has its roots in the 1925 novel Porgy by DuBose Hayward about a community of African Americans in Charleston. The novel was adapted into a play by Dorothy Hayward in 1927 and employed a cast of 66 black actors, marking a milestone in American theater. The opera pushed against social barriers, broke with theatrical traditions of blackface, actively defied segregationist practices in certain venues, and provided black classical singers with an unprecedented showcase for their skill, reflecting the composer's intention to innovate the art form by empowering the folk of his folk opera. Scholarship on the work has largely engaged with potentially problematic characterizations, Andy, and a hybrid musical score, but the unique perspective of contemporary singers will enrich our understanding of Porgy and Bess. The mission of this project is to bring those un oft unheard voices into the discussion of this American masterpiece. In more than 20 phone interviews and presentations in the doctoral seminar last semester, taking place over the last three months, I have asked contemporary opera singers to reflect on these main themes, character, score, industry trends, the community of the cast, and the significance of the work. What emerged from these conversations are responses reflecting a common focus on the integrity and depth of this opera and its range of impacts on the personal and professional lives of singer-actors of color. It is the business of professional singer-actors to inhabit the identity of character and tell a compelling and visceral story. I wondered, in spite of the argument that roles in Porgy and Bess ascribe to minstrel and other problematic stereotypes, does playing these roles minimize the agency of the actor? In other words, how do you reconcile an understanding of how the character may be problematic with a faithful portrayal? The responses to this question demonstrated extensive study of the novel, play, and score on the part of the singer-actors. This background research, which is a standard part of a professional singer's preparation for a role, was notably enriched by strong mentorship from a prior generation of leading interpreters. Well, who is this woman? Because she's so far from who I am. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> As yeah. a person, I mean, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm definitely not overly religious. And I'm right. definitely not going to like go around like, you know, shame on all you sinners. <laughs> <laughs> That's not who I am, you know. But um, so it did, it did take a lot of like pulling from other people that I've seen and that I know, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, but what I will say is the thing that carries me personally as Serena is the relationship that I have with the other characters, with mm -hmm. um, Mariah, with Porgy, I mean, they're kind of the trinity, you know, they mm -hmm. are the, of the community. You may hear my then six month old adding her thoughts on this <laughs> project. My apprehension of fate was fueled by my lack of knowledge of the depth of the character and thinking that he was a tick puppy and a, <laughs> and a underdog and not really understanding until I got into it that he possessed a little bit of the same characteristics of the characters that I played hmm. every day. He's not part of three dads. You know, everyone looks up to the king when everyone looked up to Porky. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone looked up to Zoroastro, everyone looked up to Porgy. He turns out that the way things are written, 
This long tradition of understanding the dramatic material from a literary and historical standpoint led to a general sense of these characters being representatives of their time and not representatives of an entire race. The humanity of the characters, what made them real, not necessarily relatable, was what reads on stage and resonates in the hearts and minds of these artists. As described by Daniel Washington, the fear of hurricanes is real. The relationship between whites and blacks is real. The fear of the police is real. It is just a community of people doing the best they can. Because he was a real person, mm -hmm. I try to always honor and respect his legacy and do as much dignity to it as possible. Mm -hmm. And the people around me do that as well. Mm -hmm. And so that makes Hmm. you're on stage in that final scene and you're looking around at faces and people who are, who are in it with you mm -hmm. and they're pulling for you and they're, but they're in their own character and it's just like wow I am the king of the world and I can do this and I can pull through because of my people mm -hmm. I truly believe that mm -hmm. <clears throat> The singers eloquently discussed the importance of allowing the characters to operate on their own terms based on their trajectory in the drama, even if that meant that the audience was not spared of the discomfort that can accompany challenging narratives. I recall a response by Professor George Shirley, who's just joined with us today, um, when he was asked uh, about the character of Sporting Life and how he seemed anachronistic to the rest of this community, he said, well, isn't that the point? <laughs> Discussing the score revealed multiple layers of complexity. Chief above all was the nearly universal praise in support of Gershwin's compositional process and the extent to which he sought out authentic experiences with African American culture from which to learn and develop his ideas. Those of us singers can relate to that last one. As singers approach the hybrid score, which draws influences from opera, jazz, and popular song traditions, virtually none of them changed their typical process of preparation and technique. Though scholarship has long debated the classification of Porgy and Bess between an opera and a musical, the subjects of this study spoke candidly about the difficulty of the lead roles and the extensive and highly integrated work for the chorus. Uh, well, one thing that I wish would, would uh, <laughs> whether it's a musical theater piece or an opera piece, I hope that we can, my hope is that we can put that question to rest. Basically, I don't know how important it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, whether it's defined one way or the other. Uh, clearly, his intention was for it to be an opera, and clearly, the people who perform it. So I hope my, my hope is that it gets to be appreciated for what it is. It's a great American opera. It really is. Um, and I hope 
how challenging is is the role of Bess to sing? I think it's harder than Aida. <laughs> and I think it's and I think it's harder because you throw your, your voice on the floor. Hmm. You know, you're you're singing these very high, beautiful notes at the top and then you're doing a lot of declamato in the middle. Mm -hmm. Um you know, you have a lot of chest and belt going on at the bottom. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of screaming and yelling and running on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the whole emotional roller coaster ride. It's taxing. Mm -hmm. It's very taxing, and I think people don't really understand how taxing it is. Yeah. Though high-quality performances are certainly the norm, many singers also reported gigs in which the, sco the score was woefully underestimated by the conductor and orchestra. Perhaps they wondered it is because so many of the melodies make innumerable appearances as covers and popular tunes. In this excerpted form, stripped of their operatic context, it's easy to forget that singer-actors are still delivering their roles unamplified over a large, complex orchestration night after night after night. Perhaps, though, the score was not always approached with equal integrity as other operas because it is at a work conceived specifically for African Americans and derived from African American musical traditions. There were very strong opinions about how this work is not always taken seriously and that insidious racist attitudes continue to be a possible explanation. It seems telling that at least one singer refused to speak to me on the record about their opinions on this very subject. Nonetheless, it was a common desire among these singers that Porgy and Bess be counted as equal to operas that are firmly established in the canon. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be respected. I think that, and I hope that, I hope that with the level of performance that they're bringing into it now, that it garners respect because people have to understand the difficulty of these roles. Mm -hmm. I mean, Serena is not easy. Mm -hmm. Porgy is not easy. Bess is not, not easy. easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say that was played marvelously at the dress rehearsal by the U of M students, so shout out to them. While Porgy and Bess honors black artists who perform these difficult and demanding roles, the work often serves as a token of diversity programming, reflecting the tension between performers' objectives and the opera's place in the canon. Porgy and Bess has an important history of providing a unique showcase for black singers However, each singer I spoke with could recount various experiences with troubling practices in the operatic industry. I wanted to continue to get the respect that it deserves. I wanted to see it in its rightful place in the top ten of the greatest operas ever written. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see people mounted because they want a great theatrical musical experience, not to balance their budget. Mm. Not to fill their quota or to get a grant because they have people of color in their season. Mm. It was a common experience to perform in a production of Porgy and Bess, and despite promises from the company, sold out houses, and rave reviews, to not receive any other invitation from the same company for another role. It was fairly rare for a singer to successfully negotiate to do a role in Porgy and Bess only on the condition that they were cast for a role in another opera. In the event this did occur, it seems the singer was very significantly established in a range of repertoire prior to doing their first Porgy and Bess and was supported by excellent management. Even still, some singer actors are exceedingly proud to have built a successful career doing Porgy and Bess almost exclusively and constantly all over the world. One singer quipped, Porgy bought my condo. I think that it's hard for people, traditionally they've been proven it's been hard for people to separate the characterization of local capabilities. Um, meaning that once they hear you do this, they just assume that you do this really well and they don't imagine that you do other things really well. Mm -hmm. um, as a young singer, I think that I still respect the Porgy track. I think that if you start, you start down that, that road, you just have to get off that road, you know? Mm -hmm. For a lot of things, I mean, going back to Warfield and Ukraine, Porgy's been a vehicle mm -hmm. for discovering new singers. 
Mm-hmm. And I like it. I just, you know, it's it's one of those things that comes along, and if you're a singer of color, you, you end up doing it. The thing that you want to avoid as a singer of color is having to do it. <laughs> you know, you want to avoid that, that you have to sing poorly and best if you're going to sing at all. Controversy surrounding the opera is ongoing. More recent interviewees were able to speak in response to the current Hungarian production featuring an all-white cast. That company's justification that they are modernizing the piece and they are opening the cast into a broader diversity of singers was met with doubt and discouragement from the subjects of this particular project and candidly its author. Despite needing to confront the challenges of representation in casting, in character, and in classification, nearly all the singers, when asked if it was worth the risks, answered unequivocally, yes. Of the 20 conversations I had with singer-actors about Porgy and Bess, a sense of belonging was the most universal. The idea of finding home inside of this score paralleled with finding home within the Porgy and Bess cast. To be embraced as an artist, an individual, and a family member affords these singers, so accustomed to being the only, in the words of Louise Toppin, a truly exceptional opportunity to belong. Many singers spoke to the collaborative energy within rehearsal, wherein a collective understanding of culture, language, and relationships brought out superlative artistic expression. However, they also lifted up the untapped power of the broader professional community of singers of color forged by this opera, and the need for more diverse representation on the administrative side of the industry. For me, it has been nothing but pure joy. Pure joy. I have a family of opera singers now that uh, inspire me, that motivate me, and gives me a sense of belonging, a great sense of belonging, and pride. If I go back home, it's always so fantastic to be in the face of people who look at you, who might have some of the same experiences as you, who understand where you come from or where you've gone, um, and how you uh, grow uh, as an artist. Because you become part of a community, yeah. a very, a, a very uh, uh, special, in many ways, elite community. And the first time you do the work, you basically get int- introduced mm-hmm. to that community. But then do it one more time with one other production, and you're basically part of a family for life. Mm-hmm. I believe the voices of Porgy and Bess deserve to be heard not just as interpreters of memorable melodies or inheritors of this extraordinary legacy, but as leaders in this field and authorities on the tasks set before us as consumers and producers. A significant portion of this group of singers have moved into teaching positions, begun their own opera companies and training programs, all geared towards the mentorship and support of emerging black artists. I would encourage you to reflect on your role in joining them in this mission to expand opportunities for young singers and to rediscover the often overlooked legacy of their predecessors. To borrow a phrase from acclaimed singer Laquita Mitchell, these singers should be known and they should be thanked. Delving into the evolving story of Porgy and Bess has brought up important questions about finance, opportunity, and tokenism. As a singer who has focused largely on new music, I am eager to continue creating conversations and making these conversations public, not only about where we've been, but about what's next. Progress towards a more diverse storytelling and representation through opera and song is on a positive trajectory. And though through this project, I personally have been inspired to continue to perform, research, and commission new works that uplift lesser heard voices of our immediate and global communities. I am deeply grateful to the singers that, are, that have participated in this study and those that are to come. As a result of this project, I feel I understand the story of Porgy to be, in some ways, similar to the story of the life cycle of this work for its legacy of performers, a story of loyalty, of community, and perseverance. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Kelly. That was absolutely remarkable. Um, questions, comments? We'll start with Dr. Gaunt back here. Thank you for um, the ethnographic inquiry through the interviews, first of all. And um, uh, I, I'm left with a, a tough question from uh, the accrual of the whole symposium, but particularly from last night's session in your mm -hmm. paper, uh, that I had to write it down because it's that elusive to me. Um, and to figure out what the question was, I start like, how is it possible to reconcile the issue of segregation that whites can never perform the opera um, with it being considered the greatest American opera? Right, and, and then I went through this, I was like, you know, the sense of belonging and pride that these singers express. Um, and it made me think about Obama and the black presidency and then Oprah, her role in our culture and and the banjo, right? This instrument that is derived from African legacy, but no one remembers as that. Um, and so this, and this idea of exceptionalism that the United States is always branding of itself, but not if it's not situated within kind of a white superiority socialization or patriarchy, then it's not the kind of American exceptionalism we like. Mm -hmm. So it boiled down to like, can can Porgy and Bess ever be considered anything but a black opera, especially in this age like of this kind of rise of white backlash? You know, so I don't know if you can answer it, but or maybe if others want to. Yeah. I think we all. I think part of the symposium is to acknowledge that that's a really important question, and that's what we're in part here to do. Um, in terms of the scope of my project, um, there was some. I wouldn't say direct disagreement because these singers weren't speaking to each other at the moment, but there certainly was, I would say, a healthy diversity in terms of who was able to perform the opera um, in occasional productions. In other words, there were um, white singers who are incorporated into the chorus, like our particular production this weekend. Um, there are some European productions uh, that have used an all-white cast. And there were singers that I spoke to as part of this project who were OK with that, who said, you know, OK, that sounds OK to me, as long as it's done with integrity, as long as it's acknowledged that that um, may be uh, contrary to the wishes of its original conception, and maybe even contrary to the legal wishes of its current um, state. Uh, but there was um, flexibility there, I think, on per, certainly by the, from the perspective of the singers. Um, I think they, they were more concerned with the perception of the opera moving forward um, in the industry. That, that was a very urgent concern for them. Um, but it's a, it's a really important, it's an important question, for sure. Thanks, Kelly. I've, I love this paper and the study you've done and just all the effort that it took to get a hold of all those people <laughs> and to um, convince them that talking to you would be a productive conversation. So congratulations on that. Yeah. I, I was struck by, you, know, you were saying that um, the study and research that the singers had done was sort of, you know, the normal part of any role. Mm -hmm. And my impression from looking at some, you know, your paper and looking at some of the, talking to some of the singers has been, I've been surprised by the depth of that knowledge, but I, I just, I'm not really de debating whether it's there, mm -hmm. but it does seem like there's a personal relationship to the score mm -hmm. and to the story that, that is remarkable. Mm -hmm. So I just, do you think there is something special about this because it creates a sense of community and belonging and ownership and, and, it, and how does that play out, I think, in the, in the singer's own expression of this. I mean, there, there's sort of, if, if you will, a kind of authorship of that character of, mm -hmm. of a commitment and ownership of this piece that we saw a little bit in last, you know, last evening's panel. Do you think there's, there's something there that's special about the performing this work in particular? I do. I think uh, certainly there's an ownership of the material in a historical sense. I think many of the singers spoke in very, I wish this presentation as demonstrated yesterday where we could have gone on and on and on. on. Um, Many of the singers spoke in great detail about um, their personal connection to the story of Porgy um, and all of those sort of 
historical aspects as something that they recognize in their own lives and in their own family. So I think by, by virtue of that fact, they are very attached to it. It does become a very personal thing and there is a familiarity and a, 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 a source, a well for their artistic expression that I think is unique for them in this opera. Um, I mentioned that the that sort of a a study of the historic singers of a role and the certainly the libretto and the score is a standard part of any singer's preparation. But I think the other thing that speaks to their um, Im unique in investment in this work is the community formed around it and the conversations that are formed around it. That that seems to be a very compelling um, thing that keeps. The, the characters are very much alive for these singers in a way that I might possibly be able to argue that they are not as dynamic as some of the other roles that they play. Um, and I think a large part of that is the mentorship, is the generational inheritance in a way of this tradition. Um, Morris Robinson spoke yesterday that one of the reasons he was most nervous to start this role was because he knew and had at his disposal this incredible legacy of performers who had done it so well um, that he didn't he wanted to do them justice and I think that that tradition and that trajectory is unique to Porgy and Bess and therefore is unique to their process of um, their their dramatic interpretation you met you mentioned a, a controversy that I've heard before um, about Porgy and Bess, the question being, is it an opera or is it a Broadway show? And um, I don't know if this is something that I could Google or if there are enough musicians in the, in the room to answer this. I, I've never really understood how do you define, how would you define, okay, this has, this is definitely an opera Nobody. and and this is definitely not an opera. Oh, <laughs> there are probably no less than nine people in here who would love to get at that question <laughs> with you in very great detail. Um, so maybe they can make themselves known to you after, after this final paper. Um, but yeah, they're, they're raising their hands too. Um, I, think, I, I think one of the main things is that it did premiere on Broadway, which is part of uh, what, where the confusion may have started for some audiences. Um, again, this is, there's so many layers to this conversation, I'd love to go into it, but uh, this, the, the combination of these different musical styles, certainly on behalf of these singers, um, they are asked to do a commanding range of things. There is not nearly as much extemporaneous or Im improvisatory actin, action in this um, opera as there, is, as there are in your standard Verdi. You just won't find it. <laughs> or the conductor will remind you that it's not in the score. Um, so being called upon to do all these incredible things, and some of which it borrows from that Broadway and popular idiom, um, does, does make it tempting to want to classify it as something else and not as the, that high art, that high operatic art. And one last comment. Does it really matter whether or not it's an opera or a musical comedy? Can I that, just say one well, thing really quick in response to this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, I know we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to um, make a comment. When I was on a panel last uh, yesterday, I made a comment that might not have come through as clearly as I meant it to. There are three standard questions asked about Porgy and Bess as you survey the literature. I do not think these questions are necessarily like we have to address them all today. I was giving an historical overview because that's my job as a musicologist and I've written on this and I know the literature out there. One of the questions is, is this an opera or musical? I think we've pretty much solved that and in you know what Gershwin calls it and I'm very willing to talk about it later, but I, there have been subsequent questions that ask that. Another question that comes up in the literature is what is the full version? And so this is wonderful with this uh, colloquial, you know, this symposium and we've got the critical edition of the score. And then the third question that comes up in the literature, is it racist or not? I did not mean to say I have those questions. <laughs> I'm just saying these have been questions that have followed this work and this symposium has done such a good job of giving really compelling 
um, answers to those things. And thank you for this paper because you really have done a beautiful thing. And Kira, thanks for mentioning the ethnographic component in here. I think this is the element that's missing from the written scholarship where it's just a little bit of it's done. The performers really have a lot to say about this. Listening to them gives this work a different life. And think of what performance is doing. It's people's bodies up there on stage today. It's not really reading a novel or looking at a picture from the past. It's how we relate to it happening today. And they're saying something so important that it's wonderful to get into the record. And your paper is wonderful in this research. And I so hope, Mark, that you, you help these folks publish these works, because this is amazing. Thank you. I think that is an excellent end to Kelly's talk.